Hey guys, so I'd like to talk about diabetes. Um, and of course, diabetes is a huge problem in America with our expanding waistlines. Um, we have much more metabolic syndrome and we have much more uh, diabetic patients. So of course, type one uh, diabetes is there are no insulin is being there no insulin is being produced by the pancreas and then type 2 um, we have decreased insulin being produced by the pancreas elevating our blood sugar so you guys those are really if you're pre gestational diabetic you just know that's going to get that much worse during the pregnancy unfortunately we have a lot of type 2 diabetics getting pregnant and then we know that their gestational diabetes is going to be that much worse so gestational diabetes is a carbohydrate intolerance of varying severity with the onset of first recognition during the present pregnancy and may require insulin for regulation so you guys um, gestational diabetes uh, if you walk into the pregnancy um, with little risk factors meaning you're not overweight you have a good exercise pattern you have a good diet um, the only real reason why you would get gestational diabetes is a really bad uh, sensitivity to the drug uh, somatomammotropin hemochorionic somatomammotropin um, gestational diabetes may persist after pregnancy. Um, what's interesting, when the placenta delivers um, in about 15 hours, 14 to 16 hours, somewhere in that area, um, and the human chorionic somatomammotropin are um, human placental lactogen, same hormone, when it disappears, when it's no longer um, being secreted by the placenta, you guys, this condition resolves. We don't even need to do blood sugars after that first shift post placental delivery. So the sad thing is, is that when someone does get gestational diabetes, we know that they have a 50% chance of converting to a type 2 diabetic later in life. So um, that is a concern for us. Um, it accounts for gestational diabetes accounts for more than 90% of diabetes in pregnancy. Uh, 4 to 14% of all pregnant women get it. Um, the risk factors for gestational diabetes, uh, personal history of gestational diabetes, if you had it before, likely it is you have it again. Family history of diabetes. Um, previous big infant, a, 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 an infant that weighed over nine pounds, tells us that if your diet was okay and you only ate 300 extra kilocalories a day um, and you had a really big baby we could have had some uh, insulin resistance there towards the end of pregnancy that we really did not catch and you had a big baby um, previously explained intrauterine fetal demise let me type that out for you or we lost the baby in utero um, a lot of times you guys when they have elevated sh blood sugars in the first trimester um, you guys those elevated blood sugars of course in the period of organogenesis can cause some cardiac malformations and that can be what causes an unexplained intrauterine fetal demise um, or if there's an anomaly um, uh, cardiac conditions obviously are the big ones um, during uh, organogenesis that we really worry about here um, obesity we know obesity when you have when you're obese you have a um, increased um, fat ratio and that fat puts out two hormones that make you insulin resistant um, so that insulin resistance in combination with the human placental lactogen uh, causes the gestational diabetes you guys, this last one used to say greater than 35 years old. Now it says greater than 25 years old. So that tells you about the instant and of how quickly now this is changing, which makes me very sad that people are getting uh, gestational diabetes at a younger age. Pathophys, metabolic changes associated with pregnancy. Of course, the hormone, human chorionic, so metamamotropin, causes insulin resistance. Remember, that's also called HPL, human placental lactogen. I don't know why they changed the names of these hormones, but they do. <laughs> um, so you guys, you can just have a sensitivity to this hormone. And that sensitivity is what throws you over into having gestational diabetes. Um, of, of course, if you walk in the door with insulin resistance, and then we put this 
this hormone on you that's secreted by your placenta that makes you more insulin resistant. Um, of course, if you're overweight, it's going to increase your risk for gestational diabetes. Normal pregnancy is characterized by alterations in maternal glucose metabolism, insulin production, and metabolic homeostasis. Glucose, obviously, is the primary fuel for the fetus, so that's why HPL or HCS is so such an awesome drug is that if mom doesn't have available resources, um, it makes her insulin resistant so the baby gets um, glucose and can grow. Um, insulin needs increase during the first trimester um, and then the di di I hate this word diabetogenic effect happens in the second and third trimester due to the increases in human chorionic somatomammotropin. Um, potential morbidity maternal the mother has an increased incidence of preeclampsia of course, anytime you have elevated sugar or glucose, you're going to have inflammation in the vasculature. And so she, anytime there's changes in the vasculature, that predisposes you for preeclampsia, um, which is a condition unique to pregnancy related to hypertension. Um, infection, if you have elevated um, glucose in the vasculature, uh, that's going to cause it makes it, it's a suitable environment for bacteria to grow so um, it puts you more at risk for infection postpartum bleeding the more your uterus stretches out the less your uterus likes to contract back down so it puts you at a huge risk for postpartum hemorrhage and then a c-section which is a major risk I think people really don't understand the potential outcomes because we've done such a good job with surgery here in the United States but any but a c-section is a major abdominal surgery and while many times it's relatively relative benign outcomes there is always the potential for bleeding and hemorrhage and um, infection you guys with any type of surgery so mom um, has all those risk um, when she has to have a c-section of course pulmonary embolism could go on and on about the c-section risk we've already talked about so potential morbidity or mortality of the infant um, macrosomia means big baby greater than 4,000 grams and birth trauma related to maternal hyperglycemia so you guys what's unfortunate is this is a huge baby and this huge baby gets damaged or injured trying to come out through the pelvis and through the vaginal canal um, so you guys the baby can have an injury um, due to mom having too much glucose and making it too big um, interuterine growth retardation let me spell that one out for you too I should have done that I apologize our growth restriction I'm sorry um, related to poor placental perfusion and so now you guys let's just say in case one where this baby is really big that means the placenta was functioning fine we didn't have a ton of damage to the placenta um, the sugars were not high enough to cause vascular damage and cause the placenta to calcify now come down here to intra intrauterine growth restriction you guys now this is a different scenario this is where the sugars were so high that it caused so much vascular inflammation and it caused calcification and damage to the vessels so now the sugars were so high it created vascular collapse or calcification of the vessels and the poor baby now gets no nutrition gets no oxygen so you guys this um, pre-gestational this is somebody who's come walked in the door with a type 2 diabetes and it's just gotten worse and worse of course we know that this increases incidence of birth defects usually this is happens um, prior to the uh, first trimester they've had elevated blood sugars before they got pregnant um, this is responsible for neonatal hypoglycemia so you guys these poor babies um, when they are used to high blood sugars of course there's a lot of excessive glucose going over the placenta to the baby of course now this baby is going to have high insulin levels and so you guys when the baby is born the baby is going to go through a fight or flight and is going to produce epinorepine and cortisol that is going to allow the baby to quickly utilize 
all of the glucose that's available. So the baby will burn that excessive glucose very quickly, but unfortunately it does not burn the insulin. The insulin will hang out longer than the glucose. So unfortunately these big babies with high sugars at the time of delivery they go through the fight or flight or stress response. They blur, burn all the glucose so now they're left with hyperinsulinemia which is the same thing as hypoglycemia. So you guys we have to monitor these big babies for three to four hours after delivery take their glucose to make sure that their glucose is not too low and give them um, oral glucose if needed until that insulin level goes back down. Um, lastly, this is really important for you to know you guys is infants born to diabetic mothers have five times the normal risk of respiratory distress syndrome. And you guys, this pathology is due to increased insulin. So you guys, when the baby has increased glucose passing over the placenta, the baby is going to have increased insulin, obviously. When you have increased insulin, you guys, this increased insulin alters the production of surfactant. So when you have increased insulin, you have decreased neonatal lung surfactant. So you guys, if a woman is well controlled with her diabetes, she has the same risk respiratory wise as someone who does not have gestational diabetes. But unfortunately, if women, the higher their circulating blood sugars are above normal, the greater the risk for respiratory distress syndrome. Um, you guys, these patients, um, they have such high risk of respiratory distress, the babies do, that we will not let them have a C-section or a delivery um, until they are term. Um, you guys, if if we think, okay, so this baby is somewhere, is something, we want to really get this baby delivered, and let's say this baby is before 40 weeks, you guys, in order to prove that this baby has enough surfactant, you guys will do an amniocentesis, withdraw the uh, amniotic fluid, and test to make sure there is enough surfactant. It is such a problem. So you guys, glucose logs. You got to look at her glucose logs every time she comes in and educate, educate, educate about that her baby could have respiratory distress and have to go into the NICU to get oxygen, to get surfactant down an ET tube, to get all of these things um, simply because she did not regulate her blood sugars. So gestational diabetes, signs and symptoms, hydramnios, um, anytime uh, we have a situation where there's high sugars, of course, osmotically, uh, fluid is going to um, come to that, to that high sugar area, and you're going to have um, an altered amount of amniotic fluid. You're going to have too much amniotic fluid. Um, my, uh, my macrosomia, of course, big baby, and you'll be able to see that on your nursing assessment. They'll be able to see it on ultrasound. Um, we'll have an increased fundal height that's greater than plus two um, centimeters. Persistent glucosuria, that's self-explanatory, and may have ketonuria. If it's really bad, you guys, if she is not regulating her sugars and her sugars are really high, she's going to burn fat and muscle, and she may have ketonuria. So you guys, you can see here's HPL, and so um, you can see the first uh, little while, weeks of gestation, um, the blood sugars actually kind of come down. But you guys, right here in this first 13 weeks, if she has really high elevation, blood sugars that is a huge risk for cardiac defects so this is why pre-gestational counseling is super important you can see her her um, her insulin dose lowers right here um, from 13 to 20 now here's where HPL or human placental lactogen starts to increase and you guys this is 100% evolutionary physiologic to allow us to when we don't have food that we're insulin resistant and our baby gets the glucose. So you can see the higher the HPL, the more the insulin um, dose is needed for the mom. So right here at 40 weeks, of course, the baby's growing this whole time. You've got that HPL. So of course, you're going to need more insulin or oral control, whatever you're doing. And then when the placenta delivers, look at this fall. Boom falls straight down. So you guys, then you don't really need much. Now you can see if you're not breastfeeding, 
you're still gonna your levels are gonna go back to what they were before but if you're breastfeeding of course your levels are lower and um, it's just an awesome thing so you guys really um, at 40 weeks after the placenta is del delivered if you were not type 2 um, diabetic or you were not diabetic when you enter the pregnancy you're gonna go back to um, the normal status and you will no longer need the insulin or the um, oral control so screening, so you guys, obviously if you're over 200 pounds, we know that you're already insulin resistant, um, so you're at high risk. So we assess them at 24, at, at an initially, we do a one hour glucose tolerance test um, to see what her glucose is. If it's uh, over 130, um, you guys, then we're gonna, in less than 200, we're going to go ahead and do a three hour glucose tolerance test here at the initial exam. Um, and then if she passes those, then we're just going to um, re-examine her again at 24 weeks like we do everyone else. If they're low risk, a glucose tolerance test will be performed um, before 24, uh, between 24 and 28 weeks. We know that's when HPL starts to spike. Um, they get a 50 gram um, drink as PO, oral glucose. They don't need to be fasting. We just tell them don't have a lot of sugar before you come. And then you guys, if we, if the sugar um, is less than 130, we're great. No problems. They don't have it. But if it's greater than 130, up to about 200, um, we're going to do the three hour glucose tolerance test. Now, what's interesting is you say two, 200 JBT, yes, 200. You guys, if they're over 200 at a one hour glucose tolerance test, we already know they have gestational diabetes. Why would we put them through a three hour glucose tolerance test? Do you guys see that point? I'm sure that you do. Um, if they have a three hour glucose tolerance test, how do we diagnose them? Two of the four readings. So you're gonna have four readings. You're gonna have a, uh, the initial reading, a one hour, a two hour and a three hour and if two if two of the four values are elevated we then deem you a gestational diabetic okay
Bibles. Someone to lose a baby simply for um, gluc for for not adhering to glucose control, and then um, maternal mortality is five to fifteen percent. Um, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, I f neglected to tell you that this is on page six ninety nine of your book, and you can read through that. But I've pretty much given you um, the lowdown on that. Thank you.